to get going on this talk, um, I'm going to be a little bit general because of the, the wide diversity of audience we have here. And um, by way of an introduction to the topic, um, it's a little bit of background, which probably everybody knows from their first year science courses, is that when you do a, a complete comprehensive analysis of, a, of plant material, you can detect about 50 elements in the plant from the macro right down to the parts per billion of some very rare elements, uh, most of which are actually really not uh, useful. About 17 of the elements are useful to plants. Um, and these are essential for plant function throughout the life cycle. Um, and of course the standard laboratory experiments that are used to determine essentiality is um, having an element missing whilst all the other elements are present. Um, in that case, they are potassium. Um, so this is a table showing the macro and the micro. And what, um, what I'm going to really look at really is the lower half of the table here. And um, these six or seven um, elements are the ones that are essential for plant function. Um, and uh, you can see there, there are concentrations in percent if you want to convert that to parts per million, which is the common analytical term, multiply the value by 10,000. Um, and here are their common functions. And listening to some of the talks this morning, um, a lot of talk about biomass production uh, for various reasons now, um, not least of which is the biomass production for carbon and nitrogen sequestration. Of course, um, really, you can't really have any biomass without this list of elements being present at at least the minimum level. Um, so um, it's qu it takes quite a lot of um, some of these elements to actually keep a plant uh, going. Um, zinc, for example, um, on zinc analysis of plants, um, you'll see that the minimum amount of zinc in a plant is about 20 parts per million. So um, um, these elements must come from somewhere. And uh, either we apply them uh, chemically, which if you're an organic farmer, you're not inclined to do. Uh, well, then they must come from the soil store. But quite a lot of things in life are finite, including the elemental content of the Earth's crust. Um, we're not short of the elements, they're just in the wrong places, and they're in the, in the wrong form, um, and not in the right place at the right time. So um, if we want to do biomass production, we've got to keep these elements in view all the time and look to see where they're going to come from if they're not present in the soil or can be uh, leached from the permanent store in the soil, well then we may have to consider applying them by some means, either by fertilizers or by, uh, by foliar sprays or even by recycling from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from animal slurries and so on. Um, now the... Um, the, the microelements there are mentioned are, you know, chlorine, iron, manganese, cobalt, boron, zinc, copper, nickel, and molybdenum. Um, cobalt is also could also be included there as a catalyst for nitrogen fixation. Um, silicon, which is very rarely mentioned as a as an essential element, um, is also nowadays mentioned in some of the more modern literature for its function in the compartmentalization of other metals and also for structural purposes. Um, and these elements function in, in, as cofactors and as non-protein helpers in, in enzyme reactions. Um, then a further set, set of elements, um, which are listed there on the bottom, um, iodine, fluorine, selenium, vanadium, tin, which is not often mentioned as, a, as an element, chromium, are essential elements for animal function. So these elements must be present as well, because animals predominantly get their food from biomass. So the plant must have the further complement present, uh, at least from a natural point of view. Um, this is to take you back to your, again, your first year science, the periodic table of the elements, showing the, um, the essential elements that are required for, for humans, which includes most animals as well. And um, as you can see in the periodic table, you have the S block, the P block, and the D block. This may be new to some people, but most people from, 
first year science will know a little bit about the periodic table. The reason it's up here is that it shows that these elements, because they come from different parts of the periodic table and all the chemistries are different, well then the elements are going to be different uh, in terms of their chemical properties uh, when, they're, um, when they're present in soil or in geology. Um, so for example, something like phosphorus, um, it's a p-block element. It's likely to be present as an oxide. So therefore we have phosphate. Um, similarly, selenium here, a very important element, a trace element uh, for both plant and animal, um, exists mostly as, a, as an oxide. And um, um, it will exist therefore as, a, as an anion because the, the selenium oxide is an anion. Um, whereas on the other hand, some of the other elements here can quite, awfully, quite happily, well these particularly, can exist only as cations. And these similarly can exist as both cations and anions. But the, the purpose of the table is to show that the, the very, very diverse chemistry of these elements in the soil, notice that they're all coming from the top of the table as opposed to the bottom of the table. At the bottom of the table, these lower ones here are really only present in parts per billion in the geology of the world, consequent on the, the theory of the Big Bang and so on. So there's another list of the elements, which I can pass over now because you've seen them. And, um, but there's one element there which um, I didn't really mention too much, which comes up now and again, is not shaded, is actually boron. Now boron is last, not listed as a, an essential element, but it has some important functions and some research study shows that it's a very good anti-cancer agent. Um, and um, some, a study in America found that when levels of boron are quite high, it decreases the incidence of prostate cancer, which is getting very common, by about 35%. But uh, that may not mean that it's um, an essential element. Um, however, it's often recognized as an essential element. Um, so um, this, this particular slide here is just giving a general view of some deficiencies in metals that occur. Iron is the most efficient element in the world. But not so much because it's deficient, because of lack of uptake, it's deficient for other reasons as well, is that, um, is that diversity of food in certain parts of the world, especially in the African countries, uh, has led to very, very um, large deficiencies of iron there. But also because of some plants don't really take up iron very well, particularly rice species um, are very, very poor in iron content. Uh, iodine is also a very uh, deficient element, about a billion people in the world are deficient in iodine at any one time. Um, copper and zinc are also likely to be deficient in manganese, as you see they're deficient in most forages in Australia. And, um, and other studies also in, across Europe show deficiencies of these elements um, quite a lot. And you see there the last one where in Sweden where the level of chromium in, in, um, in grain has dropped drastically over a over 30, year, 30 year period. Um, now, um, the seven elements that, um, that the seven elements that are needed for, for, for animal animal function um, are, are, are are mentioned there, and um, it's generally assumed, maybe erroneously, that plants that the content of a plant is going to be um, digested and absorbed completely by the animal, but some studies, an in vitro study, which is this one here. Um, demonstrates, I think if I can see it properly, um, uh, just with my glasses on because, um, oh sorry, I'm, in the, I'm in, the wrong, in the wrong slide there for talking about that one, but um, so um, the, the question really is, is, um, is, the, uh, is, is, is the plant the best place to find the element or is it in the soil itself? Um, so for example, in the case of iodine, you can find lots of iodine in soil if you do a total iodine analysis. Um, but uh, in the plant analysis, which is the most recommended way to look for iodine, um, the level is quite low, 0 0.03 to 0 0.35 parts per million. Um, and um, sometimes that can be difficult to, to, to detect this level here. But measuring in the soil at these levels is okay because you're measuring the total iodine content, but the problem is only a fraction of that is actually absorbed by the plant. And you need to be able to determine the, the bioavailable amount. 
Um, so that's, that is why in some cases, plant analysis is recommendable. Um, going back to a point I was trying to make there previously about the um, gastrointestinal absorption, um, we're inclined to assume that if it's in the plant, it will be in the animal. But in actual fact, some studies, in this one here, an in vitro study, has shown clearly that uh, in the case of copper, the different plant species um, absorb differently in in vitro circumstances. And therefore, it can't be really assumed that all of the element will actually assimilate into the bloodstream from the actual gut. 24% there in the case of spinach in one particular case. Um, so that assumption can't be really made in, 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 any, in any case. Um, when we're doing analysis, we, we use these extractants. And I won't go into the chemistry of this in any great detail. Suffice it to say that we generally rely on four levels of extraction when we're looking for the available. This is for soil now, but soil available. And um, we have um, the complexing agents. Um, you might well ask, what is a complexing agent? And I probably won't tell you today. Um, a complexing, uh, soils uh, themselves have natural complexing agents. And somebody mentioned um, uh, some organic complexing agents in previous talks there. The organic fraction of soil um, has quite an amount of complexing capability in it. So uh, quite a proportion, of the import, one of the important compartments in, in a soil is the, is the organic fraction. And, um, and in the organic fraction, there will be a certain amount of the element complex. Um, the second one there is neutral salts, which is, which is calcium, chloride, and ammonium nitrate. They're good for what's called the labile fraction. Labile means that which is easily accessible um, and can be taken up by the plant. And then, of course, there's the non-labile fraction, which is more difficult. In that case, you need um, a, a mixture like um, <clears throat> mineral acids to get the, the non-labile fraction. And then you've got the organic acids, which are weakly acidic and, um, uh, and actually can be used to um, dissolve these metals by leaching, uh, which gets the labile fraction and some of the non-labile fraction. Um, the complexing agents, um, these last ones here and item one, um, they're quite strong and sometimes considered too strong for what we want to determine, which is the labile fraction. Um, the, the research that's done to determine what's a useful extractant um, is comparing the actual uh, concentration in a plant um, versus the concentration that you found in the soil that grew that plant. And we have this uh, R squared, which is an expression of correlation or relationship between X and Y. And we get values here, which ideally should be one or could be one in an ideal situation. But comparing two elements, or sorry, uh, listing two elements and comparing three extractants, we get correlations of 0.64 for potassium nitrate on copper, uh, 0.65 for calcium chloride on copper, and so on. And um, if you get a correlation, which is obviously positive number one, and two, which is greater than six, 0.6, well, that's a reasonable correlation. So you can say that this extractant, potassium nitrate, is a good mechanism of actually catching uh, the element. Um, now, uh, the reason I put up the periodic table and mentioned the chemistry and the complex chemistry of the elements is that um, uh, the elements can be present uh, in different oxidation states. Now, an oxidation state is is plus one, plus two, plus three. It's the number of, it's the charge on the, on the atom, or charge on the element. And um, if you want to understand anything at all about soil chemistry, you must have at least some kind of an understanding of the oxidation states of the elements. Because all of the elements have their own unique oxidation state. Well, not, not unique, but um, elements have a particular oxidation state, or maybe two oxidation states, or three oxidation states. For example, manganese, has two oxidation states, um, Mn2 plus and Mn4 plus. Mn2 plus is quite um, bioavailable. Mn4 plus isn't that bioavailable. And the same is true for most other elements. They all have an available 
oxidation state and the non-available or less available oxidation state. Also because the chemistries of all these elements are different, there's different solubilities, different complexing abilities. Um, so all of these factors come into play in understanding bioavailability. And that is why the, the, the phenomenon of multivariate analysis comes into play when you're trying to understand how much of the element will get into the plant. And um, just an example there where <clears throat> In the, case of, um, uh, in the case of some of these uh, factors, such as pH, for example, um, and CEC, I'm not sure how many of you understand what CEC means. CEC is cation exchange capacity, which is the, the number of sites or the amount of sites or the quantity of sites on soil which is capable of holding elements in place uh, until such time as they're ready to release into the liquid the, the aqueous solution of the soil and be taken up by the plant. Because it's only via the aqueous solution that the element can be taken up by the plant. It won't be taken up from the solid state or any other state other than the, the free solution state. And that's why the element must come from the uh, solid state into the liquid state and then be taken up by the plant. Um, but the CEC and other factors uh, dictate how much of this element becomes available. Um, and that's where multivariate analysis comes in. So for example, um, calcium chloride uh, was used as an extractant for a list of elements there, copper and zinc, cadmium and lead. Um, and the correlation between that and the plant value was 0.54 to 0.69, which is reasonably okay. However, when pH, organic matter, CEC, three really important factors which come up time and time again were included, the correlation coefficient increased significantly, which proves that, or shows that, or indicates that, the use of co-multivariate factors, or multivariate correlation or regression, is a very useful tool in trying to assess the true value of bioavailability. Um, a very big study, actually, a Dutch study, which was mentioned there in the last uh, paragraph, um, says that, uh, or shows that and produces a lot of correlation data for a number of elements to include the, um, the, 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 the multivariate parameters which are also characteristics of the soil and the element. Sulfate, carbonate, hydroxide. These are the anion parts of the, of the element. Soil texture uh, and the clay content, of course, which keeps coming up time and time again. There are a lot of advanced techniques now which are used to determine bioavailability. We're not short of techniques, uh, we're short of people and time to do research and money. Um, isotope dilution mass spectrometry has been around for a long time and it's very helpful because what it does is that if you get an isotope, an element like cobalt or nickel for example, nickel has a couple of isotopes. Isotopes are elements with different uh, atomic weights. And um, so um, if you can take nickel and, uh, and, and uh, uh, produce um, a certain proportion of, its, of, its, of the element and its isotope and spike a, spike a fertilizer or spike the soil or whatever and leave it to its natural devices for maybe a period of time, a set period of time, maybe six months, a year, two years, three years, the isotope and the, the element and its isotope will distribute itself amongst the compartments of the soil and the plant and then by sampling this, this, the soil and the plant in a, after a period of time, maybe a couple of growing seasons, doing the isotope analysis, the element and its isotope, you can tell effectively where the, ice, where the element has been in its cycling within the soil and within the plant. A very good, very good technique, very expensive. Used a lot for environmental analysis. The second one there of many, there are many techniques, I just mentioned two, is, um, is this one, diffuse gradient in thin films. <clears throat> This is effectively creating little membranes which are very, very similar to semi-permeable membranes of the root itself. And from those, you can actually determine um, the fluxes of the element from the liquid state into the plant, the solution state into the plant. And um, this is used quite successfully. And as you can see that the diagram on the right, or sorry, the diagram on your left, showing uh, cadmium and, um, and copper. And you can see the flux. The flux is the number of Picograms, if you know what a picogram is, is 10 to the minus nine of a gram 
or sorry, 10 to the minus 12 of a gram. A nanogram is 10 to the minus 9, a picogram is 10 to the minus 12. So the flux is going on at all the, all the time from the, <clears throat> from, the root, from the liquid state or the solution state into the plant, are really in the, in, the, in the 10 to the minus 12 of a, of a, of a gram per second per centimeter square per second. That's how the flux is measured. So it's really, really very small. But because it goes on over months at a time or maybe years at a time, the, the value accumulates. Now, this diagram here is just one example of uh, how, for example, moisture content can uh, determine an increasing flux for both of those two elements into the plant. Um, I'm going to skip through a few slides here very quickly because they relate to analytical science, which is, which is really... Um, uh, coming up to, to analytical science, which is really not really directly relevant to what, we're, what you're, what you're uh, thinking about today. Uh, but um, there are lots of accepted standard methods um, around the world and in Europe for determining avail available elements for, for plants, plant available elements in soil. And uh, I won't list them, they're listed there. And uh, so um, when you send samples to the laboratory, you're really sending them into a place which is full of instrumentation, which are spectrometers mainly. And these spectrometers rely on the, 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 the discipline of atomic spectroscopy. In other words, nearly everything we know about the world is determined by spectroscopy. Everything we know about the, 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 the planet Earth and beyond, uh, an awful lot of the information that we get from extraterrestrial particles and so on and so forth, is really defined by spectroscopy. And the spectroscopy is based on, again, your first year science, chemistry, um, orbitals and excitation. So if you excite, excite an atom for a while, it will eventually deactivate and emit photons of light. And every single element has its own unique fingerprint. And, and those fingerprints are the way we determine the element. For example, chromium is an element. Um, it's got an emission wavelength or several wavelengths, sometimes up to 100 different distinctive wavelengths. So if we see chromium, if we see light of three, five, seven nanometers, wherever it comes from, whether it comes from a soil particle or water or air or an extraterrestrial particle, we know that's chromium that's out there. So we identify the elements by their spectroscope. spectroscope. Um, an old technique which goes back to the 50s invented by, by a guy called Walsh, an Australian, was atomic absorption. This was slow and cumbersome and went through several iterations. It involved a flame and these lamps and so on and so forth, and it's now um, replaced by a more modern technique, which is, I'll flick on to there, is actually the plasma torch. The plasma torch is this guy here, which works in argon. It operates at 6,500 uh, centigrade, which is a phenomenal temperature, and it atomizes every single thing to at single atoms. So it takes all the molecules that are in the soil, or soil solution, and gets them into atoms. It looks like that when you're looking at it, it's an expensive instrument to run, and therefore making soil analysis expensive. It operates on the principle of spectroscopy, as I said, but you have to have very good gear with it. And this little gadget over here at the end, and all of these diffraction gratings, culminates in this thing here, which is um, a pixel camera, which is the bit that's inside in most of our cameras, the good cameras, is the thing that picks up all the said wavelengths. And this, the beauty about this device is that it picks up all of the wavelengths at the same time. So if you have one test tube, you put it to the instrument, it sucks up the liquid, next thing you see all the elements together, which is great. And therefore, you see a picture like this, where each of the elements is shown with its own spectrum and what's called calibration graph, and that's very neat. Um, so it allows us to do an awful lot of work very, very quickly. Um, which means that we should be doing an awful lot more of this work, which we're not, of course. Uh, and that's the pity, um, because I know you'll be asking me, is my soil deficient in zinc? And I'd say yes, if, you, if you've measured it. But if you haven't, you won't know. And only a very, very small proportion of the soils in Ireland are assessed every year for zinc, um, unfortunately. Lots of assessment for potassium and for phosphorus, but only one in every 20 is assessed for zinc, or less even at times. Oh, yeah. Okay, so moving very quickly, this, um, uh, uh, this device here, the ICPMS, is the one that's used for measurement. And I'll skip through a few slides there, but one thing here very quickly in passing is that the great thing about it is that it gives you isotopes. 
as we mentioned earlier, isotope dilution mass spectrometry, if you can see isotopes, it does a few things for you, but one of the things it does for us in the laboratory is says, if you see the isotopes of that element, which is cadmium, I think, I'm not too sure there, um, you know 101% that that is the element. It's a, a surefire uh, way of knowing what you got. This is just, um, this is from Chagas data, and um, these, are the, these are the quantities of, of the elements that you expect to find in your grass, if grass is what you're interested in. And just the one there, zinc is the one that, of all the elements there you could pick out, zinc is the one that is interesting, even though it's not unremarkable to look at, but it's the range there, 20 to 60 milligrams per kilogram. 20 milligrams is a lot of milligrams. It's a lot of, it's a lot of milligrams in a kilogram of grass, and it must come from somewhere. And a lot of soils don't have that amount of zinc in them uh, to actually give to the plant. So therefore, that is why zinc all over the world is deficient almost all the time, and including in humans. If you do your serum zinc today, the chances are that you're deficient in zinc. It's one of the most deficient elements um, in the, um, of all of the trace elements that are used by plants or animals. Um, so, uh, um, analyzing plants or soil, which, which is it? Um, both are done, but typically on about a 20 to one ratio. For every one plant that's analyzed, uh, there's about, for every one plant, there's about 20 soils. The ratio is, it should be a lot more plant, of course, obviously. Plants give a lot more information, but it is a bit of a, the plant is a bit of a snapshot, whereas the soil is, a, is more of an integrated value, especially if you do the total element content in the soil, it gives you a long-term view of what you've got going into the future. Um, the reason we do soil is that it's easier, and you can see there, there are 200 soil samples on that array there, that, on that robot. We don't have similar robots for plant analysis. When we will, we'll have a lot more plant results. Plant analysis is more expensive. It's slower. You're using a lot of dangerous acids or health and safety issues involved. So that's why people tend to keep away from it. And in soil, you're just extracting the elements. So you're not actually interfering with the plant, uh, uh, interfering with the, with, the, uh, with the sample too much. It's a quick process. Going very quickly through a few elements, and I won't stay too long at them, starting with copper. We mentioned oxidation states. Copper has two oxidation states. Copper one and copper two. Copper one is t t pretty, pretty insoluble. Copper two is soluble. So you like to have copper in the, in the divalent state, which is kind of a more oxidized condition. So if you have aerated soil, you will have lots of copper two. Copper two, copper also likes to be complexed. So it goes very well with organic matter. So when organic matter is high, copper availability is good. Um, standard methods are used for extraction, um, EDTA or Another technique which has been researched for the last maybe 35 or 40 years is the Melik. Uh, Melik is American, very, very popular in America. If you want to do a lot of elements very quickly, the Melik extraction is very good. Zinc. Um, zinc has uh, one oxidation state mainly, that's zinc two. Um, it's an easy enough element, it's quite bioavailable, it's quite mobile, it's, it's quite soluble. The problem about it is that if you have too much phosphate uh, in the soil, it precipitates zinc. Uh, so zinc can be a problem from that point of view, and um, zinc deficiency is, as you can see there, in, is shown by um, <clears throat> chlorosis, uh, venal chlorosis. Uh, manganese, also uh, a very, very important element involved in several metalloenzyme reactions, anything up to 20 uh, in humans and animals. And um, the, the thing about manganese there, and I, I'll pass through it quickly without going through the, the content of the slide, um, manganese has two states, two and four. Um, four, as we said, is fairly insoluble and fairly inactive. Manganese two is quite active and quite soluble. So therefore, when we're testing for manganese, we do what's called easily reducible manganese. So the manganese that can be reduced easily from state four to state two. And that's how manganese is extracted. Again, uh, the uh, EDTA method is used, but Melik is also a very good technique for measuring uh, uh, manganese. Molybdenum. Um, molybdenum has, uh, is also um, an interesting element um, in that it actually has soluble states and insoluble states, or less soluble states. So molybdates are quite soluble. Um, molybdites are not so soluble, so therefore if you have an oxidized condition, um, you will have molybdates and they're quite soluble. The presence of iron as well also produces a soluble form of molybdenum because molybdenum and iron are very close to each other in the periodic table, so they help each other out, and therefore they have relationships with each other. 
Um, an example of a multivariate analysis is shown here in the lower part there, where um, if, you know the, if you know the pH of the soil, and if you know the, um, the uh, uh, what you call it, the iron content of the soil, you can put them into a little equation, and you can get a value for the bioavailable molybdenum, which is much better than your, the, the molybdenum result on its own. So, so, so having, having a few other factors into the equation and using these equations, which is quite easy nowadays because the computer does everything for you. Um, um, uh, selenium, also very, very essential element and um, evolved a lot in, in, um, with, with vitamin E and, um, of course, um, uh, uh, um, uh, selenates. Um, selenites and selenates are both forms of selenium. And um, again, pH, very pH dependent, high pHs extract selenium. Um, and um, finding a good method for actually getting selenium um, is difficult, but we tried out one method based on a number of Chinese studies and other studies in the Asian region where uh, 0 0.01 molar or 0 0.1 molar phosphate uh, correlates exceptionally well with plant uptake. So we are using that one and uh, uh, with David Wallace and the Danu project, uh, EIP project, and we're hoping that we'll be able to correlate those results hopefully sometime in the future with the um, uptake values. Um, boron, um, I won't say much about boron, only to say that it's also, uh, it's, it's, it's essential for plants and possibly some use to animals as well. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's got a pH dependent solubility. High pHs definitely don't suit boron uptake. Um, so mid pH is suit, suit boron uptake and hot water extraction is the best choice of method for, for boron analysis. Um, and I'll move very, very quickly towards the end here, and this is a table that a lot of you have seen many times, and it's the, it's the, it's the pH range, because pH is almost mentioned with every element there. It has a pH, an optimum pH range, and uh, the reason I'm putting up this is not because it's new information for you, but it's, all, it's, it's, it's to make the point that we really should have one of these figures uh, for each of the elements, uh, not only for pH, but also for organic matter, uh, for redox potential, for CEC, and for all the other uh, soil properties that, that go into determining whether an element is bioavailable or not. Um, and that is the matrix that's produced when you do that. Um, so you could take an element and use all of those characteristics. The top characteristics are the characteristics of the element. The y-axis characteristics are the characteristics of the soil, such as texture, structure, CEC, um, oxidation reduction potential, and so on and so forth. Drainage even, plant type. And of course, something that probably should be in there as well is the biotic index of the, of the soil as well, because that that's, plays a major part. Um, okay, just got to conclude. Um, plant and animal deficiencies for the elements are well known. Um, plant uptake is dependent on multiple factors, as we discussed. Um, soil analysis must reflect availability, obviously. Um, uh, must differentiate deficiency from uh, toxicity states. A lot of tests that have been devised are used to determine toxicity of the elements, such as toxicity of molybdenum and so on, uh, and selenium even. But down at the lower end, we need to be more sensitive. Um, neutral salts are very, very good and probably a little bit overlooked for determining bioavailability. Bio and finally, uh, a, a multi-extractant like Melic is very useful. And then lastly, multivariate analysis has to appear more and more in uh, soil testing to give you a more precise picture of bioavailability. Thank you.